Alrighty, cherubs. So today we're going to talk about Byzantium, the Byzantine Empire. If it'll pop up, there we go. Byzantine Empire. And this is really what's going to set the stage for the rest of the medieval period. And we're going to stay with the themes that are introduced here in the Byzantine world until we get, until we're done um, with the medieval period and we start the Renaissance. It's really the Renaissance that kind of jumps us out of the, the Byzantine influence. So in Byzantium, we're going to be talking about a church, a couple of mosaics that go along with it, uh, another church, uh, an icon, and a manuscript. Alrighty, we've got the architectural terms, the pendentive and the squinch, as well as the centrally planned church. So go ahead and look in your flashcards for, for these two. This one I've, I'm adding in, it's just the inside view of the pendentive and the squinch, just so you can see what it looks like because this photo isn't very descriptive, especially of the squinch. Um, there are a lot of videos that I do want you to watch, um, and they're going to be linked down below, and I want you to watch these again because they're going to give you a much, much richer understanding of these spaces and what they were trying to accomplish here in the Byzantine era, so please give those a watch. The theme for uh, Byzantium is five F's and an O. The f and the five F's are flat, full of gold, frontal, floating, and frozen. And it's all surrounded by a circle. Byzantine art is going to have all of these characteristics. Right? They're going to lack depth. They're going to use gold as the um, embellishment. They're all frontal. I mean, you're just going to see the front of these of these uh, the people that are in them. They're not twisting and turning and moving through space. They don't either carry a lot of weight on their bodies either. They look like they're floating visually, and there's no movement. Byzantine art is very very quiet. It's a very quiet art, um, and you'll see what I'm talking about here. And then they're going to love this use of the circle. Okay, they're gonna love the dome. They're going to love uh, centrally planned buildings. They're gonna love the use of halos. So just keep your eyes open for the circle. Okay? The Byzantines are really the Romans, all right? They're going to move the capital. Constantine is gonna move the capital of the Roman Empire in the early 300s to a new city. He's ending of another round of civil war in the late empire and so what he's going to be doing is he's trying to reunite here let me show you the roman empire was all of this okay but by the time of constantine we it had split into four chunks and there were four people ruling over you know one person over each section Constantine, what he does is, and they're all fighting amongst each other. They're called the Tetrarchs, and they're all fighting amongst each other. So what Constantine does is he conquers everybody else, and to get to kind of try and reunify the Roman Empire, what he does is he abandons the city of Rome and gives it a new capital. So he takes the capital away from Rome and moves it out to this city, which is right here, which is called Byzantium at the time. And he renames it Constantinople. So we're going to have a new capital, um, and they're going to have a new religion as well. He's going to endorse Christianity as the official state religion. So Christianity is going to get a big boost and become the official religion of the Roman Empire at this time. So as a, as a way to unify his people. So Constantinople, Byzantium, sits at the edge of Europe and Asia. All right. And so it's this really well protected city out here at the eastern end of the empire. Go ahead and give the TED Ed a watch. It's going to give you some historical context about why they're still Romans and how they change from being Romans. See, they're going to still see themselves as being Roman, even though they abandon all, you know, the city of Rome, okay? And they're going to last for another thousand years, which is really, really exciting. So think that the Roman Empire really only ended in 1453, that um, 
we think of it as ending in the, about the 420s, but it really lasted until 1453 um, with the final uh, fall, the conquering of Constantinople. Okay, so again, the, the clip will give you um, a lot more context as far as the history of Byzantium. The important dates for the Byzantine Empire. We're gonna we're gonna stay really early. Actually, we're, all of our pieces are gonna come from this early time period. Um, iconoclasm, the Middle Empire, another Golden Age. The Crusaders are gonna come, occupy Constantinople, and then the the last flowering of it before it finally dies. Um, so this is how the the history is is broken down. Things about Byzantine art that you need to know. You need to know what an icon is, what it looks like, um, and what it's used for. You need to know how they're going to stylize, how they're going to denature um, people in their art. And they're going to stylize for very, very specific reasons. They're doing it intentionally, and we're going to see how that plays out. And that's going to influence the rest of Europe for the rest of the medieval period. Okay. Um, you need to know who Justinian is and what role he plays in the empire, how he affects art and architecture. You need to know again, remember what a mosaic is and how the Byzantines, how the Christians in the Byzantine empire change the look of the Roman mosaic and what they do with it. And you need to know how they innovate and take Roman engineering and take it to the next level. Okay, Byzantium is going. Constantinople is going to be the cultural hub of Europe throughout the medieval period, and it's really only the fall of of Constantinople in fourteen fifty three that allows Italy and Florence and the Renaissance to kind of take its place and become that cultural center. So we're going to start here in the Eastern uh, Byzantine Empire with a manuscript. Now this is from a book called the Vienna Genesis. Remember Genesis is the first book of the Bible. Um, <clears throat> And the Vienna Genesis comes to us, and it has, it's an illustrated manuscript, an illuminated manuscript. Illuminated meaning it has pictures, and manuscript, mono, meaning hand, and script, written. So it's a handwritten picture book, essentially. Um, it's coming to us from a royal workshop, and we know that because it is so richly decorated. The pages are going to be dyed purple. Okay, and that purple was an imperial color. It was a royal color because it was so expensive. They had to, um, they, they made purple, it was called Tyrian purple. They made it from a, a, a sea snail from the Eastern Mediterranean. And you had to take the animal that was inside this shell, this, uh, this sea snail, and crush them up and boil them. And, and eventually it would turn purple. Um, and you had to do, use thousands of these snails to make the smallest amount of dye. So it really was a very expensive color. So it becomes the imperial color in the West. So that's why purple is a, a kingly, you know, royal color. Um, so the pages are dyed purple. Now you need to know that they are written on parchment. Parchment is not fancy paper. Okay, it's not just kind of this marbly gold colored paper that we use today. We use that, you know, for fun stationery today. We call it parchment. That's not parchment. And baking parchment is not parchment. Okay, parchment is um, animal skin. So they're going to skin sheep and goats and stretch their hides and cure them. And there's going to be a clip here in just a minute that'll show you the process of how you make a medieval book. And it's an arduous process. It is a long, long process to create a book. So that's why we still have this, a good chunk of this book. Again, the whole book doesn't survive, but we have a good chunk of it surviving for 
1,500 years. This was composed in the year 500. So this is a very, very old book. And the reason why we still have it is because it's not written on paper. It's written on parchment. Okay? Now you can see here that the text is written above and the pictures are down below. Now the text on this particular image is kind of hard to see. Um, and we'll get into why here in just a second. But let's talk about the image that we're, we're looking at here. We're seeing a city, a woman with a water jug, and she's walking along a path that has a colonnade. Another woman is sitting by the water, the source of water, and she's got a water jug as well. The first woman, we see her up here again, and she's wearing, because we know it's the same woman, she's wearing the same outfit, pink and blue, with the water jug. She's giving this man water to drink, and the camels are drinking as well. Okay, so this is the scene from the book of Genesis, from the Bible, of Rebecca and Eliezer. Let me jump here. Remember, if we remember Abraham from last time, Abraham and his wife, Sarah, are going to have a son named Isaac. Isaac, it's getting old enough. He's time, it's time for him to get married. Um, they don't want him to marry just one of the local Canaanite girls. They want him to marry a girl from Ur, from back home, the old country. So they send their servant, Eliezer, to go back to travel all the way back from Canaan, from Palestine, all the way back to Ur to find a wife. He and... Eliezer decides that he's going to bring back the first girl that will offer him, because he's been traveling a long time, offer to uh, give him a glass of water. And so that's what this story is. So, and that's who Rebecca is, is the girl who offers to give the servant a glass of water. And while he's she's giving him water, he says, hey, how do you want to, do you want to come back across the world and marry my master's son? And she says, sure. And so that's what happens. So Isaac gets a wife, Rebecca, and she gets picked because she was kind and offered this a stranger a glass of water. But when we look at the picture, um, we can see that they are showing us folds. They are showing us some movement. Okay, you can tell we've got this classical colonnade happening. We're getting this this female nude in a kind of this classical pose, but you can tell that the scale is wrong. The scale is completely wrong, and it's a compressed narrative. You're getting these two figures happening again, just like we did in um, the Last Judgment of Hugh Nefer. Okay, and how they compare to the city as well. The, again, the scale is all wrong. The camels are all shown in profile. So if you think back to the Alexander mosaic, how the animals were twisting and turning in space, that's not what we're getting here. Again, we're getting these kind of flattened, stylized uh, animals and this flattened and stylized rendering of space. Okay, so this is the beginning of the Byzantine tradition here. Now here's another page from that manuscript, and this is Jacob wrestling an angel. Jacob, let me go back here, is the son of uh, Isaac and Rebekah. He gets into a fight with his brother, and he leaves. He flees Canaan. He flees Palestine, and he goes back to Ur to hide from his brother because his brother's going to kill him. While there, he marries uh, two sisters, Leah and Rachel, and then he marries their servants. So what's being depicted here in this is he's coming back home. He's leaving Ur. He's been in Ur for almost 20 years, and he's coming back home to Palestine. So we have this guy right here is Jacob and a servant. The two wives, Leah and Rachel, this one's Rachel, this one's Leah, and the sons. Then they had, between his four wives, he had 12 sons and any number of daughters. Um, so again, we're getting this twisted um, 
perspective here where the the space like furls around because the artist didn't have enough room on the page to make it all stretch out into one thing so he, he bends the story right here as he bends this bridge around and it's this like noodle shaped we can see the 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 floor of the bridge the whole way around so it's again it's this weird warping of space um, Jacob becomes separated from his family at some point in this journey back to Canaan and fights with a man. He gets into a tussle, uh, wrestling match with this guy who uh, the text hints at is an angel and demands a blessing of him, which is what's happening here. So we're getting the family walking. They're continuing their journey. Isaac, get, or excuse me, Jacob gets separated. He tussles with the angel, the angel blesses him, and the family continues on their journey. Now, uh, this moment right here is one of my favorites, where this guy is leaning over this bridge here, um, watching. One of the company is leaning over this bridge, watching, looking at the water, which is just enchanting. And again, you can see how we've got this colonnade. You can see like her back. You can see there is some movement happening. You can see there's a, a an attempt to show some value and um, some shading, but it's not a very convincing attempt. And we can see that they're starting to look flattened. So that we do still have some pull from the classical world in these pictures, but it doesn't look like, you know, the Pantheon, um, or excuse me, the Parthenon friezes. It doesn't look like um, the Great Stele of Ajesu. It doesn't look like the column of Trajan, right? We've, we're starting to get more stylized now, and that's going to continue and deepen as we move through the Byzantine era, all right? Now check out the text, and this one the text is a lot clearer in this example, and you can see that it's written in Greek. The Byzantines are going to be speaking Greek. They're not going to speak Latin. They speak Greek. So this text is from the book of Genesis, like I said, and it's in Greek, and you can see that it is Again, this is a royal document. This is a royal book that's coming from an imperial workshop. And we know that because, again, the pages are dyed with this purple. And the letters, now they appear to us black, but really they were written in silver. And the silver has oxidized and turned black over the course of 1,500 years, as silver is wont to do. It's, they wrote in glue. <laughs> and then applied the silver on top of it. So it's this really, I mean, you can imagine how it glowed, um, how it just reflected the light and just glowed. I can't even imagine what this book would have looked like in its day. So this is the Vienna Genesis, okay? Um, here is a, is a, again, link down below, is a clip on how to make a manuscript. Please watch that. And then um, another more analysis of the, the uh, Vienna Genesis. So please give those a watch. So again, they are serving as Bible illustrations. They are modeled in very, very shallow settings. Again, the space is not rendered convincingly. The size is not rendered convincingly. We are starting to get more abstract. We're not sure of the origin. Perhaps it comes from Antioch. Perhaps it comes from Syria. Perhaps it comes from Constantinople. We're not sure where it comes from, but we do know that it is an imperial uh, commission. All right. Only part of the book remains. 48 out of the original 192 illustrations survive. Okay. So that takes us to Justinian. Justinian is going to um, be the emperor that you need to know about. He rules Constantinople, and his his father and he are going to come from the north, and they are kind of nobodies, and they work their way up through the army, um, he and his father, and his father becomes emperor eventually, and he's kind of the guy who's the force behind it. All right. Go ahead and give Justinian and Theodora a watch. She is an interesting, one of the most fascinating people that we're going to talk about all year. Um, they are an interesting couple. So what's going to happen is during the reign of Justinian, he's going to extend 
the Rome, the the rule of the Byzantine Empire, to include the rest of North Africa. Again, they're going to reconquer all of all of this, everything that's west of this, Italy, the islands, the Balearic Islands, and parts of Spain. They're going Gibraltar. They're going to reconquer those for the um, for the empire. Okay, so Justinian is going to push the boundaries of the Byzantine Empire to its largest extent, which looks like this. Now, in Italy, excuse, yes, during the reign of Justinian, in Italy, again, here's Rome. They're going to, ha the administrative center is when they move, when they reconquer Italy, it's not going to be Rome. It's going to be another city that's up here, um, and it's called Ravenna. We'll get to Ravenna in just a second. Make sure that you watch the clip on the Nika riots. Okay, make sure you watch this. This is very, very uh, interesting. Justinian's reign was not um, perfect. Justinian was um, forceful. He was determined. And he could be very um, vicious. And he did, uh, he was ruthless. So go ahead and give this uh, a watch. Now, the first thing that we're going to talk about under the reign of Justinian is a church in Ravenna that he has commissioned, he builds, to be kind of the, the church of this imperial, you know, outpost here in the far-flung regions of the empire. And it's the church of San Vitale, Holy Life. And you can see here that it is not a basilica form. All right, it has this, it's an octagonal shape with, on the inside, it's going to be this dome, but on the outside, again, it's octagonal, so it's not, it doesn't look dome-ish. Here's the apse, it does have an apse, because Christian churches are going to have that apse now, but it's octagonal, and that's going to be important here in just a second. So you, again, you look on the outside, and the Church of San Vitale is not very, it's, okay, yeah, it's brick, that's exciting. Uh, but it's not super gorgeous. And again, the reason being is that on the inside, that's where the splendor is because the outside's in, this, in the mundane, secular world, but the inside is the sacred space. That's why it's going to be so richly decorated. Justinian is going to spare no expense here in this church in uh, this, the Church of San Vitale. He's going to have marble from all over brought in, so various stones brought in, and he's going to cover it in mosaics. And that's the thing about Ravenna, about San Vitale, is that it's going to be covered in mosaics, and they're going to be golden, and it's going to be spectacular. Now, here's the floor plan of uh, San Vitale. Again, this is a centrally planned church, which means that it's not Axial. It's either axial or central. This one's central because it radiates out from this center point. Okay, it's not a rectangle. Um, you can see again the apse here. Now, the octagonal shape is important. The octagonal shape is important, and I'll tell you why. In um, early Christianity, the idea of the okay, we and we talked about this before, where the square represents mortal life began it represents the planet you know the planet earth and mortality so what happens when you have mortal life but you superimpose another mortal life on top of it when you have mortal life but then a new beginning a new mortal life mortal life squared not eternal life but just a new life okay that's what you get with the uh double locking squares. And if you t look at the shape on the inside of the interlocking squares, it's an octagon. All right? And that's what's happening here. And they did this very purposefully. Now, if you go inside of um, the Cathedral of the Madeleine, if you go inside different churches, you will see that the baptismal font inside many Christian churches is octagonally shaped. And it's for this very reason. It's because it's you have your old mortal life and with the 
with the Christian uh, ordinance of baptism, you are beginning a new mortal life. Mortal life, new mortal life, the octagonal shape that it creates becomes a symbol of rebirth, of regeneration, of resurrection, new life. And that's why San Vitale is octagonally shaped. Okay, so fill out this uh, flashcard, this fun architectural term, a centrally planned church. Okay, circular or um, octagonal.